Oh, as the hush comes over the room. If everyone could come on in, take a seat. We will begin Renter Summit 2000. No, I, I'm, I'm kidding. There won't be a 2001. <laughs> this is it, folks. <laughs> However, we will be discussing policy. Well, welcome. Good morning. My name is Judy Nicastro. I am one of your nine. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? Thanks. Uh, I'm one of your nine city council members. There are nine of us, and I am so thrilled to see that so many of my colleagues are here today. If there is one thing that we all agree upon, it is affordable housing is a priority. So I would, yep, it is for our city. I would like to ask um, my colleagues to come up here so that everyone can be sure to see who they are and talk to them when they get a chance. Peter Steinbrook, uh, Jim Compton, Richard Conlin, Council President Pageler is here, Jan Drago is here. Anyone else? Am I missing anyone? Nick Licata is here. We're going to thank your staff as well. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. 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 Come on up, Jan and Nick. This is your city council, and we are your legislative branch. We are not your micromanaging branch. We are your legislative branch. And um, we all take affordable housing very seriously and as a priority. And together we will trudge through these policies, some of these policies, and many, many others. So I want to thank them for being here, for being so supportive of this effort, and for um, their continued support financially. You know, the city council is paying for almost all of this. And so it would not be happening if we were not, they were not all chipping in, not personally, but as a group. So thank you all. And, um, Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I want to do a couple of quick thank yous because this event could not have taken place without a lot, a lot of hard work by a lot of wonderful people. The city council's administrative staff has um, endlessly been just saying, what else can I do? What else can we do? So let's thank them. Central staff. The council has a wonderful central staff area that does our research. They've done a lot of the research for the policy paper. Also, the city departments, design, uh, Department of Design, Construction, and Land Use. Diane Sigamora has done um, a phenomenal job of being open and helping us all along. Department of Neighborhoods, Office of Housing, the Mayor's Office, and the Seattle Center, which has donated this facility to us today. So we could give them a round of applause. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was flipping pancakes at a charity, uh, the Millionaires Club, a wonderful charity, and met Tom O'Keefe, who is CEO of Tully's. And here he was, and Jim was there too, and there he was flipping pancakes at 8 o'clock in the morning. And he said, if there's anything I can ever do, don't hesitate to ask. So I did. I asked, would you donate some Tully's coffee? And he did. And I'm so proud to take his corporate sponsorship and his support because he believes in community and he gives back to community. The CEO of a corporation does not have to be flipping pancakes at 8 a.m. in the morning for our community. So he is a fabulous person. Yeah. Um, also, so much of this work has been done by volunteers. We have an army of volunteers, and I would like them to, um, to please stand. Uh, Lauren Melodia. Robin Tier, Stephanie Pure, Gabriella, Anne McNally, Marley Oaks, Anya Benton, Diane Yates, and the Green Party. So you guys could all stand. Thank you for getting out all the information. And if Jill and Charlie can come up here, Jill and Charlie are my two legislative aides who, uh, when I, I offered them the position, I said, um, here's the one, the one rule is your life is mine until the summit. You'll be doing 80 hours a week until then, and uh, it will be gruesome. And not only have they done that, never once have they complained. They love this project. They love this city. Come on up here, you guys. I want everyone to see these amazing, amazing people. Yeah. <laughs> um, we... We really are a team, and we um, are so passionate about this issue, and we are, all three of us are renters. Jill is actually in the market, so for all of you wonderful landlords who are out there, please help her today. 
Um, and we, we've, they've just done a phenomenal job and will continue to. Um, many of you have gotten familiar with, um, have talked with them through the office and will continue to do that as we work on this policy, but thank you. Thanks, you guys. Um, I also want to thank the participants uh, for the summit. We have moderators and the panelists who are all volunteering their time. All of the organizations and individuals who made wonderful policy suggestions and helped us shape, shape the ideas that we are discussing today and that we will continue to discuss. And all the landlords out there, I've met some of you today, who are keeping rents below market rate. Thank you. Renters who have contacted our office, who have the courage to speak up against some of the fear and the retaliation that they are afraid of experiencing, and just having the courage to voice their opinions. We are also joined by other elected officials and some of their representatives. Nori Katabe is here from, uh, from co-speaker Frank Chop's office. Larry Gossett is here. Larry, if you could stand, yes. He is with the, the King County Council. Also, Senator Adam Klein is here. Where's Adam? Yes. He's been a real champion for housing. And Tom Byers is here from the mayor's office. Is Tom here? And the mayor will be joining us later this afternoon. The National Mayor's Conference is in town, so he's busy with that. He'll be here uh, this afternoon. Okay, now for a relatively brief speech. I know I started this, my political career, being much briefer than I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, I believe we are fighting for the soul of our city. What is the soul of a city? It is the wonderful, diverse people who live in our city. It's not the chain stores or the world-class stadiums. It is the people. The people, the people who live in our communities, walk down our streets, walk in our coffee shops, and work in our coffee shops and bookstores, the people that we become friends and partners with, it is all about people. Seattle is growing and changing quickly. Most of us, most of those who have helped define this city and made it such a wonderful place to live are now being priced out of their homes. Some say move somewhere else, go to where the rents are cheaper. I say no. This is our city. What defines a city is the people who live in here. And this is what these policy discussions are about. Renting used to be a temporary situation. Uh, a stage to go through on your way to home ownership. Well, that's no longer true. Renting has now become a way of life. And as one of my friends said recently, I used to have a dream of owning a home. Now my dream is just to be able to live alone. <laughs> so she doesn't have to have a roommate. Living month to month, unable to invest money that we have to use in order to pay rent, restricts us from ever having home ownership opportunities. People are making more money. Although some people are earning more, and we are seeing that some are earning more and some are not earning more, the dollar simply does, no, does not go far enough. This is not the 40s or the 50s or the 60s. This is the year 2000, where we now come out of school with enormous debts to pay off. There are family situations. People are uninsured and are, have medical costs now. It is a very different America. That $20 that you were able to store away, you may not have uh, any more to store away. People from every perspective will argue whether or not we are in a rental housing crisis. But every day, Someone calls my office, often desperate, with stories telling us how their rent has gone up 10%, 20%, or 30%. And even if it is 10% and they're on a fixed income, they can't pay that. If your wage didn't go up in correlation to your housing cost, you're at a deficit. You've lost money. I have one of the best landlords in Seattle. I have been a renter in Seattle, well, a renter in New York as well, my whole life. And I was lucky enough nine years ago to find the best landlord in Seattle. Why is she the best landlord in Seattle? Because she cares about community. She cares about our community. She cares about our neighborhood. She rents raises, she rents our, she raises our rents when taxes go up. She has the right to pass that on to her tenants. She always gives us 60 days notice of a rent increase so that we can plan ahead. She doesn't want to jolt our budget. When a tenant moves out, which is 
very, very rarely. She raises the rents to get closer to the market rate, but she always stays under the market. She communicates with her tenants. She is a model landlord. She is this city's best friend right now. And all of the landlords who are keeping rents below market rate, and there are some here today, and there are many in our community who do care about community, are this city's best friends. Imagine right now if they all were getting the market rate. Literally, my landlord could double my rent today, and she'd have a line out her door. I wouldn't be able to afford to live in this city. Others wouldn't be able to. The people who make us, who serve us, wouldn't be able to. The disposer. Uh, the, dis the disposable renter mentality that is shared by landlords who are only out for the highest rate of return on their investment regardless of who is displaced, be it a senior, a working person, or someone else in our fragile population, is what I believe who government is there to regulate. And that is why I am asking the public to help us. Do you want your city government to protect its people in its renting population? That's what this is about whether or not government should intervene in regulating a certain segment of the population and to what extent. This is a public issue debate. Today we will be discussing six policy proposals laid out for you on the agenda. It is by no means a complete list. It will take many creative policy ideas implemented together to have an impact on the affordable rental housing crisis. We need your help. We will be having comment cards. We need to hear from you. Someone mentioned the other day how um, in the mixed in, in the mixed use buildings, they're having a hard time in some of our neighborhoods renting out the commercial space. And they said, what about using that for artists live workspace? That's a great idea. We need to hear those type of suggestions, the creative ideas. I need to give some disclaimers before I wrap up. A few housekeeping measures. Um, housing is understandably a very emotional issue, so let's keep our discussion today about policy and not make them personal. I, after the weekly article, I can't stand up here and tell you that I have not gotten emotional and have said, um, at, at a minimum, one inappropriate comment. <laughs> um, and it was inappropriate and it is not um, respected in my new job, which um, this new f role of a civic leader, I have not fully embraced that um, things I can say in my living room, I can't say in public. So I ask you, because I do believe it was inappropriate for a public official, and it is not healthy for civic dis discourse, um, to rise above that, um, my mouth is sealed, and for us to have a good, healthy policy discussion. Secondly, State law, thank you, hey, good, well thank you. Um, state law permits city officials to use city resources to lobby the state legislature. Only by advocating a, official uh, city positions or interests directly to the state official or state employee. This law does not permit city officials to use city resources to urge citizens to lobby the state legislature or to encourage in any other type of indirect lobbying of state officials or employees. What that means is I cannot tell you what to go do in Olympia. So if you're all waiting for me to organize a big grassroots effort to go down to Olympia to either advocate for a law or to repeal a law, it's not going to happen. That's up to the people. I cannot legally do it. Finally, the council and the city are here to, hear, here to talk about policy, what we can do to make your lives better, the lives of renters. So I hope that you will embark on this journey with me. You're all here today. This is certainly not the beginning, uh, not the end. This is just the beginning. <laughs> I am happy to introduce Dennis Keating. Last year, when I, when I started talking about rental housing policy and found out about the state law, um, that preempts the city from doing many things. Uh, the House, the State House uh, Housing Committee asked me to come down and educate them on, on rent control. They wanted to hear about what is rent control. And Steve Van Leuven, Representative Steve Van Leuven, called me up and said, you're gonna, here's the data. I knew nothing about rent control, except that I lived in a rent-stabilized apartment in New York City, and it just seemed to work fine. And New York City didn't seem devastated. So, so I, 
went to the library, did some research, and saw this man's name, Dennis Keating, everywhere. But I couldn't get the book. There was a new book out, and I couldn't get it. Frantically, I went over to the web and found him, emailed him in the middle of the night. The next morning, he popped up and said, how can I help? And he sent me his wonderful book, and he helped me learn about various forms of rent regulations, what's worked, what hasn't, and he helped me with my speech, and he is a real champion on this, on this issue and so many others. Dennis is a professor of law and urban planning, chair of the Department of Urban Studies, and is acting dean of the Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University. He is one of the leading experts in the areas of urban housing policy, urban and neighborhood development, housing law, and land use law. He has authored several books, some of which include Rebuilding Urban Neighborhoods, Rent Control, Regulations and the Rental Housing Market, and Displacement, How to Fight It. He currently serves as a consultant for several programs surrounding housing and welfare reform, including the Center for Neighborhood Development, as well as HUD's Empowerment Zone programs. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker for the Renter Summit, Dennis Keating. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today in Seattle, and it's an honor to address a, a meeting like this. Very impressed by the turnout. Uh, Judy asked me to uh, provide an overview as a keynoter to your uh, meetings today, and you're discussing the policies that are in the handout that uh, she and her office have provided, so I will try to do that and uh, within the time frame that you have in your schedule. The housing problems facing renters across the United States and here in the city of Seattle are daunting, and they deserve serious attention, and I'm sure you'll appreciate that today as you discuss these issues, which I'm sure you're all well familiar with. I believe that a wide cross-section of those uh, interests are represented here today, as I understand it, from those who have been invited to participate in the summit. Uh, that kind of participation will certainly be needed in Seattle and cities across the country if we're going to seriously address the problems of renters, particularly those of low and moderate income. Uh, Council Member Nepastro, in your handout has identified uh, five policies and a sixth issue that you're going to be discussing, so I will try to set the stage by looking at some of the overall issues comparing Seattle's situation to the rest of the country, and to the extent that I understand the housing issues in Seattle, try to uh, relate, as I understand it, these policies to your problems. May not get it quite all right since I've only been here for a day, but I'll give it a try. Uh, nationally, the Clinton administration and the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, uh, have promoted primarily home ownership as a major uh, goal in this country, and they take uh, pride and claim credit for increasing the home ownership rate uh, to slightly above two-thirds of all the households in the United States. And I'm sure many would applaud that. Uh, on the other hand, Secretary Andrew Cuomo, I guess he's going to be in town here in a couple of days related to the Mayor's Summit, uh, issued a report to Congress in March of this year and documented the worst shortage of rental housing affordable to low-income renters since uh, his department began issuing these reports about 10 years ago. HUD reported an all-time high of 5.4 million households in the United States with what they call worst-case housing needs. That's an increase of 600,000 households, uh, certainly well over a million, possibly two million people uh, from the first report back in 1991. Uh, who are these households? They are households that have incomes below 50 percent of the median for the area. They do not receive any housing assistance from any level of government, including the federal government. They pay half or more of their rent, I mean their income, for rent, or they live in substandard housing, or all too typically, both. These worst case housing needs have increased dramatically, especially for minority households. In the last decade, the national government also reports the loss of 5% of all the units uh, available in the United States to low-income renters, almost 400,000 units gone. Demolition, arson, conversion, other uses. Uh, it's not a, a happy picture. Compounding these data are several other factors. First of all, uh, it's national policy to eliminate many obsolete or uninhabited public housing units. 
there's great uncertainty, and I understand this is uh, the case here in Seattle or metropolitan Seattle. Uh, great uncertainty surrounding the effectiveness of our major housing subsidy program, the Section 8 program, even when it's available. Uh, market rents often being higher than HUD's ceilings on what the government's willing to pay to assist renters. Many landlords uh, unwilling to participate or with the shorter and shorter terms of the federal commitment, uh, many becoming much more interested in market rate tenants, not subsidized tenants. Third, the difficulty in financing and approving multifamily housing in many cities in the country, lots of opposition to denser housing, lots of opposition to apartments. Lots of opposition having renters in the neighborhood. Uh, four, continuing discrimination. I know there's some pamphlets here today on the subject, and despite all the laws we have in the United States, in our states and localities, uh, there's still great discrimination in the housing market documented by the federal government, whether it's against uh, people of color, uh, families with children, and other uh, tenant groups that still find it very difficult to uh, have free choice in the housing market. And finally, uh, ineffective local housing code enforcement in many places, which uh, mean that people paying a great deal of their income for housing are still living in substandard or overcrowded housing. In addition to the low-income tenants, and HUD simply addressed the question of low or very low-income tenants, uh, many tight housing markets across the country, uh, moderate income tenants, whatever your definition of that uh, is, including the federal governments, find themselves paying in excess of a third of their income for rent, and that's more or less our standard in this country. Uh, this is all happening in the midst of the unprecedented economic boom that we are enjoying, uh, the best uh, since uh, the beginning, or I should say the end of World War II and the beginning of the second half of the century. So times are good, times are not very good for all too many of the renters uh, in the United States. Uh, certainly, you have to give some credit to the federal government and uh, Secretary Cuomo and his uh, department. They have been trying to persuade a rather conservative Congress to renew and then increase housing assistance, and they've had some success. Uh, housing assistance, at least to poor renters, and they have made efforts to improve public housing, although one could debate uh, their choice of policies. In any event, as the federal government's uh, own data shows, uh, we have a long way to go to deal with the uh, renter housing problems in this country. Uh, I'm not going to try to repeat a lot of material that's in the uh, handouts you received, but I did think there were some statistics that stood out to me in comparing Seattle to this national picture. And your city office of strategic planning uh, also issued a report a couple of months ago in March. And as I understand it, your situation parallels in many respects this national picture. Uh, about a quarter of all the Seattle households earn less than 50 percent of the median income for this area, uh, causing a demand for something approaching 60,000 rental housing units. Only about a third of that demand is being met either through government assistance or through private market rents that would be affordable <coughs> to people in the uh, low and moderate income groups. This reflects the uh, HUD finding that the uh, worst situation for low income renters in the United States by region is the Western United States. I think we're in the Western United States. so that. Uh, put you right where they say you are. Um, from 1995 to 1999, as I understand it, rents have exceeded the increase in tenants' income. That's pretty typical around the country, particularly for people in the middle, moderate, and low income income brackets. And your rental vacancy rates here in Seattle, neighborhood by neighborhood, and overall are extremely low. That's generally what is defined as a housing crisis. In 1999, according to the city, renter households needed a minimum income of over $30,000 to afford the average cost rental in the city of Seattle. And according to the city, uh, you have three choices. Faced with these conditions, uh, in the absence of government assistance or finding those wonderful apartments that uh, people can't afford, uh, pay more for housing, uh, live in overcrowded housing or otherwise inappropriate living conditions, or move outside the city and commute. Uh, longer distances. Uh, I assume that those are not choices that uh, most renters would find particularly good choices. Uh, the squeeze on renters and the shortage of affordable housing units is not limited to low-income renters. I read the Wall Street um, Journal Northwest article repeated in the local uh, weekly paper about a tenant receiving the triple monthly rent increase when the building was sold. That's a all-too-typical problem, I think, in very tight housing markets like Seattle's. 
uh, where the landlord buys the building and refinances the mortgage. According to that same article in the Wall Street Journal, the experts that they quoted predicted that even though uh, there has been a fair amount of construction in new apartments in Seattle, that this would not meet the continuing increased demand and that in any event, most of the apartments planned, they're going to cost $1,000 or more a month, which I believe would put them out of the reach of uh, most of the renters in need of the housing. Uh, nevertheless, you're going to discuss today ways to improve getting uh, more units, more apartments built, increase the supply, but at the same time try to make that increased uh, new housing more affordable to those who are suffering from the conditions I just described. In our society, renters have too often been treated as second-class citizens. And the most egregious example of this, which, how many homeowners do we have in the room? OK. Uh, we homeowners are a privileged class in this country, two-thirds of all the households in the United States being homeowners. While not everybody itemizes their federal income tax, the federal government provides a very generous entitlement, at least that's the way I view it, a subsidy to every homeowner in the United States who itemizes their income tax. They get to deduct the mortgage interest payments. They get to deduct their state and local property taxes. What do renters get when they fill out their income tax return? Nothing. Uh, they receive no subsidy, no entitlement from the federal government unless they are so lucky as to receive some direct form of housing assistance in all too short supply, particularly in the last uh, roughly 20 years from Washington. 1997, and this is the last time the uh, statistics were made available, the federal Government through the United States Treasury Department in income it did not collect uh, subsidized homeowners in this country to the tune of $92 billion. Renters again received zero. And landlords in the past have also received income tax um, benefits or whatever term you choose to use through the federal income tax system. Worse, in terms of equity, most of those homeowner subsidies go to the middle and upper income groups in the United States. The people with the most expensive houses, the most expensive mortgages uh, in the areas paying the highest property taxes, they get the most subsidies. So even within the framework of federal tax policy, it's highly inequitable to low and moderate income homeowners or people that do not itemize. In contrast, in 1997, um, despite the fact the Clinton administration did make some improvement in the programs of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, the entire budget of the federal government that went to low-income housing, in contrast, was $12 billion. Quite a contrast to homeowner subsidies. Uh, across the country, state policy is very similar to federal policy. Generally, where states subsidize housing, they favor homeowners and homeownership over tenants. Uh, I understand the state of Washington, the majority of the funding from the Washington State Housing Finance Commission's bond programs, for example, go to subsidized homeowners as opposed to rental housing, although I believe the Housing Trust Fund has certainly, through its programs, benefited renters, including here in Seattle. These federal and state policies giving preferential treatment to homeowners reflect the power of the various lobby groups that benefit from residential real estate and development, most notably banks, realtors, home builders. Uh, they all have very powerful presences in the state capitals, I'm sure here in Washington, and in Washington, D.C., that other capital. They support policies and programs that they see in their interest and those of those who benefit uh, from their programs, homeownership and homeowners being high in the list. Renters, on the other hand, rarely have a strong and effective voice in state capitals and certainly not in Washington, D.C. The best chance for tenants to influence public policy, therefore, is at the local level, cities like Seattle. Uh, here you had neighborhood organizing, you've had tenant organizing. Uh, I think that's the most appropriate and the most likely place for tenants to organize. I understand you've had levies that have passed, unlike most cities, where the city does provide money to support housing programs, primarily benefiting affordable housing for renters. I know that Seattle has made progress in providing housing, particularly affordable housing, through the Seattle Housing Authority, through the city's programs. Uh, as I understand it, there are about 18,000 subsidized housing units in the city. Uh, Seattle's tried innovative approaches in the past to preserve lower income housing, although I know as a lawyer and a law professor that some of those attempts were thwarted by the courts. For example, the uh, housing preservation ordinance a couple decades ago. As I understand it, the city still through its um, 
downtown bonus program, its transferable development right programs, have been able to assist in the preservation of at least some low-income housing. I know your landlord-tenant law provides tenants with some greater protection than in other places, at least against arbitrary evictions and major rent increases. Uh, all that said, as the action plan that you have in that uh, yellow folder uh, indicates, and as this most recent city report that I read uh, states, much, much more is needed if renters in Seattle are to be adequately housed. The demand for rental housing has outpaced the construction of new apartments. Uh, rents are rising faster than tenants' incomes. You have low rental vacancy rates. People are paying more than what would be normally considered acceptable or adequate. You've got overcrowded housing, and you have substandard housing. Uh, I believe the most dramatic reminder of the magnitude of the problems facing uh, many of the city renters is the waiting list for public housing which I believe exceeds 10,000 people at this point. It's, I'm sure, a long, long wait to get public housing in the city. While the state of Washington, like some other states, have preempted some policy, op policy options that might be used by the city of Seattle, Seattle can still do more to assist renters, particularly those below the median income. And you have before you a list of at least five options that you'll be discussing today, and I'm sure others will follow. Uh, the first three proposals deal with increasing and preserving the supply of new and existing affordable housing, first of which is promoting the construction of new uh, housing, but new housing that's more affordable than the likely prices to be charged. And your first proposal tries to deal with that by providing another incentive to developers uh, dealing with the parking requirements. Uh, certainly any way to reduce the cost as long as they are passed on all or part of them to the tenants. I think is admirable, and uh, as I understand your traffic problems, perhaps that might complement other attempts to um, get people out of cars and into public transit. In any event, uh, this approach, which parallels the city's tax exemption program, would seem to offer uh, some assistance in reducing the cost of some of that new construction. And it certainly, it seems to me, it's fair to ask for a trade-off uh, from developers if their costs are reduced, the tenants are going to occupy their new apartment building should also benefit. The proposal to build upon the city's design demonstration program to actively promote additional units, mother-in-law, so-called granny units, accessory apartments, shared housing, uh, all those which usually require some changes in land use regulations, uh, possibly accompanied by some financial incentives, uh, certainly could help. It's been tried and worked in other cities and seems to be uh, worth discussing and hopefully has the support of neighborhood associations and groups in Seattle. The uh, second proposal aimed at affordable housing preservation, building upon the city's housing preservation fund. With rapidly rising rents and housing values in Seattle, it's going to be very difficult to keep existing rental buildings uh, like the one featured in the papers that was sold as the cost of the um, buildings rises rapidly after they're sold. And that example in the paper certainly illustrates it dramatically or melodramatically. Uh, in the case of condominium and cooperative conversions, you have regulations which provide just modest payments to tenants who do have to relocate if they can't buy after conversions. But there's no such uh, provision for people who live in apartment buildings where simply the owner sells to a new owner. Giving organized tenants and nonprofits a right of first refusal to purchase apartments, assuming it's legality here in the state of Washington would at least afford them some chance of trying to preserve their buildings and uh, prices they already pay. Obviously, to do that, they're going to need help, some kind of subsidy for mortgage assistance or financing to keep the cost uh, down. Uh, in a hot real estate market like Seattle's, it's not going to be easy, but it's been tried elsewhere. And to prevent the kind of displacement that often follows gentrification, I think you should explore that. And I certainly found it interesting that Seattle already has such a law, at least for the owners of houseboats, so if they can do it for houseboats, hopefully um, those of you who are shorebound could also enjoy perhaps a similar right. <clears throat> Not the right to buy, but the right to try to buy. Enforcement of housing codes and landlord-tenant laws, um, for example, uh, are needed to protect tenant rights. You already have such laws in effect here, given the tightness of the rental housing market, expanded notice of rent increases, expanded tenant relocation assistance where it's necessary should be considered. Even though the city's past programs for rental housing inspection and registration 
have been legally challenged, and as I understand, they're now discontinued for the moment. Uh, there need to be continuing efforts uh, for the housing that does exist to maintain the quality, prevent retaliatory evictions or unjustifiable uh, rent increases. And I know there's been at least some discussion of creating a special housing court in my city of Cleveland, Ohio. We have such a court and it attempts to deal in a much different context with landlord-tenant problems using mediation techniques, also providing emergency assistance where necessary for tenants that uh, do have to move and are unable to afford such moves. Uh, finally, some equitable assistance to renters akin to what homeowners already receive is certainly warranted while um, income tax rebates aren't particularly relevant in your state. Uh, there is mention of the California program to give renters uh, at least a rebate on property taxes, which tenants pay obviously through the rents they pay to landlords who then pay the property taxes. Uh, that's not going to make a huge dent in the affordable housing problem here in Seattle, but I think it would recognize that tenants deserve some kind of status, if not equal to homeowners, at least they deserve some equitable or more equitable treatment. And that's uh, certainly worth considering. Uh, the last reform uh, that's mentioned will require changes in state law. And since housing problems like those facing all too many of Seattle's renters are localized, I believe that state legislature should allow localities and it's pretty common practice around the country in terms of home rule to deal to the greatest extent possible with their own housing problems through their own ordinances, laws, and policies. Or even where there's uniform state legislation, cities should be allowed perhaps to set higher standards to deal with the kind of problems you're facing. In the past, some localities have used rent controls or rent stabilization, various names for it, to moderate the level of rent increases. And such laws, while controversial, have prevented widespread tenant hardship and displacement. And legally, they are required and have protected landlords' rights to a fair return on their investment. Typically, these laws, and we're going to discuss that, I believe, in a panel at the end of the uh, morning, exempt new construction, new development. They exempt landlords who only own a few units or occupy their own units. So there are all kinds of different uh, rent control laws. Uh, however, they have been much maligned, and I notice in your Seattle Times editorial page today, uh, again, they are uh, rent control laws accused of having all kinds of terrible negative impacts, uh, and I can report to you that those are not exactly true, and there are all kinds of different rent control laws one can discuss, and we will. Uh, if they're carefully crafted, if they're enforced, uh, certainly some kinds of rent regulations can protect tenants keep the level of rent increases to a more reasonable level and prevent widespread uh, displacement of tenants in a housing market like Seattle's. Uh, again, I understand that uh, the state of Washington has preempted Seattle from even considering that, uh, so that will have to be dealt with if you go that route. Ironically, uh, Seattle protects renters who occupy houseboats, I notice, against increases in their mortgage, mortgage rents. So. I guess that's food for thought. At least some tenants do have some protection against some kind of rent increases. I believe that cities like Seattle should be decided, <clears throat> should be allowed to decide whether they wish to adopt the kind of policies you're going to be discussing today rather than having the state preempt them. Um, tenants in California and Massachusetts the last several years have seen protections that they won taken away by the state legislature with heavy lobbying, or in the case of Massachusetts, a heavily financed uh, statewide referendum campaign. Which brings me to my last point. Uh, effectively dealing with the rental housing crisis here in Seattle requires certainly participation of all kinds of different uh, interests represented today. And uh, hopefully you can discuss those, uh, I guess, as pointed out, civilly and seriously. But tenants, I think, have to uh, take the lead. Tenants have to organize their majority of the population of the city. If tenants are not organized, if they're not recognized as an effective voting force, uh, they will have great difficulty making their mark uh, on public policy, whether it's uh, city, county, or the state. Without representatives like um, Councilmember Nicastro and others, tenants' interests on elected municipal bodies often are not particularly well served, certainly not in many of the state legislatures, whether in municipal or state elections, referenda campaign, campaigns, uh, tenants must be seen as a force to be reckoned with. They must organize and they must turn out, vote, and make their views known. Uh, today's gathering is evidence of the need you have for dealing with these problems, and I wish you well in um, 
discussing and pushing on for improvements and changes. Thanks very much. Wow. Thank you. This really is a phenomenal turnout on a Saturday morning. And um, thank God it's cloudy, huh? I, I do want to acknowledge we have another council member here. Heidi Wills is here as well. Where's Heidi? Oh, good. That, thank you. Uh, that means eight out of nine of your council members are here today. So um, do not doubt how serious we are taking this issue. We're going to adjourn now for some of the detailed panel discussions. Hopefully you all have agendas. If not, they're outside. At 10 o'clock, you have three choices. Uh, three different sessions are happening simultaneously. So you can go to the right of first refusal, which is in the Lopez room. Renters Perks, which is in the Orcas room. Low cost, low impact, creative housing alternatives in the Shaw room. And at 11.10, we will, there will be two more panel discussions. One is parking incentives in the Shaw room and education and enforcement in the Lopez room. At 12.20, we will gather back here to have a discussion on local control of rent laws. And then the mayor will be joining us and we will be giving out an award to an outstanding landlord and an outstanding renter group. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the day. Ultimately, I mean, there are, uh, you can point a finger at the at uh, the ac economic forces that we uh, ha don't have much control over. You can look at the way the federal government has dealt with these issues, but ultimately the buck stops here in, in the city. Uh, the responsibility lies with our elected officials locally. They have a great deal of, of power to influence how uh, much we pay for rent uh, and the status of our housing uh, situation here in Seattle. That's what's really great about what's going on here today. This is the first time in my 20 years of activism in Seattle that I've seen an elected official take this kind of initiative to actually sponsor something to address specifically renter issues, not a larger set of housing issues or in uh, banker issues or uh, other concerns related to housing, but specifically what renters' needs are. Uh, and so we're actually really excited about it. Uh, it let's hope this is uh, the start of something positive at the council level. Historically, in this town, renters have largely been ignored. It's a reality. Uh, protections for tenants are minimal in this town. Uh, and uh, and uh, as I say, that needs to change. 52% of our population rents, and that statistic actually goes back to the, the 1990 census, so that's going to change. We are tearing down um, small units and single family houses to build more apartment units. So clearly, our rental housing uh, population is very large and it's going to only increase. And we've seen um, the, the most conservative statistic is that rents have gone up 25% in the last five years. Uh, we don't really have pure accurate statistics. We don't do longitudinal studies. But if you just ask people, if you start looking for an apartment, you know you're going to pay a lot more for what you could have gotten a couple of years ago. And that's for a variety of reasons. It's natural to gentrification, which we're experiencing. Um, and it's also natural in when somebody uh, purchases a building that the rent is going to go up because they have obviously a higher payment. It's a matter of how much does it go up? Could it have gone up slower in a more spread out time period? But we do have a lot of wonderful landlords in Seattle like mine, who are keeping rents below market rate, who believe in fair, reasonable yearly rent increases, give 60 days notice, who are really helping out the city in a phenomenal way. Of um, They are keeping the working class, the working people who have made Seattle so fabulous and continue to be able to afford to live here. And I don't believe that any regulation we do should hurt them. It should always be benefiting them. Well, all nine council members are here today, so that shows that the council is very committed and supportive of rental housing policies. Do we all agree on the six that are in my proposal? No, of course not. Um, I don't agree with everything that's being proposed, but I believe that it was an important policy discussion because for some constituencies and some groups, it is important. So what we'll be doing now is taking each one of those policies um, after this event and seeing which ones are more feasible than others. Reducing the parking requirement in exchange for affordable units, and I do want to be clear on affordable. Affordable is someone making 60% of the median income, and that would be an apartment 
apartment for about $650, $700. That is something that's much more affordable than 80% of the median income. And I think that that's the type of housing that we need to be, make sure that we're giving incentives for production. There's no dispute that the nonprofits would start using this benefit immediately. So that should not, we don't need to study that. Do we need to study whether or not the private sector will jump on this proposal? Will is requiring them to put 40% of those units at 60% on the median income for 40 years. Will they jump on it? Now, we can study that to some extent, or we could implement the law, see what happens, allow the nonprofits to start benefiting from that law immediately, and see what the, uh, the, non the nonprofit, uh, see what the private sector does do with it. So obviously, there's support on that. Um, the accessory dwelling units, the mother-in-law apartments, in increasing those. Uh, the City Council has been debating that for many years. I think it's really important for us to continue that. That's phenomenal um, extra housing that's just waiting to be had in our city that would really increase the supply. So um, I'd like to see us continue that and we'll, we'll debate them. Uh, the rental rebate program going down to Olympia and asking the state legislature to give back to renters. Um, we'll see. We haven't discussed that yet. Part of today was to bring up topics that, um, that are new, some that we'll agree on and some that we, that we won't. I just would like to reiterate the importance of, um, of this is obviously the most um, emotional and controversial policy topic being discussed today, and I would reiterate, just again, to keep it at a policy, not a personal level. We've been really successful with that today, and I think that that's the most productive way for us to work these complex, emotional, really important issues through. So thank you. I'm happy to introduce John Gould, who has an extensive history in uh, affordable housing issues. So thank you. Thank you. My name is John Gould, and I'm honored today to be the moderator for this plenary session, which is called Local Control of Rent Laws, and is specifically about rent control. My background is in tenants' rights and in low-income housing policy. Uh, ten years ago this month, I started volunteering at the Tenants' Union, where I answered questions from tenants out the Tenants' Union's informational hotline. I then worked for five years as a tenant organizer in Seattle and served another five years on the board of directors of the Tenants Union. And I'm happy to say that I've worked with many of the terrific people in this room and in Seattle on a variety of efforts to improve tenants' rights, to save low-income housing, and expand housing opportunities for people in Seattle. I'm also thrilled to see how many people are here today to join together and make Seattle a more friendly city for renters. This session has two purposes. The first is to provide everyone in the room with a factual background um, and a variety of perspectives and opinions about local control of housing laws and specifically about rent control. The other purpose is to provide a forum for you to raise questions and to give your comments um, in a public space about these issues. I'm pleased to say that uh, the organizers of this conference and Judy have uh, selected five terrific panelists uh, for today's presentation. Each of these panelists brings their own perspective, their own knowledge, and personal experience about issues of rent control and local control. First is Steve Fredrickson. Steve is a lawyer for Columbia Legal Services, and he's practiced residential landlord tenant law for the last 28 years. If you'd raise your hands uh, as I introduce you, that would be great. Next to, next to Steve, to his right, is Chris Bennis, who is a lawyer specializing in real estate law and is a board member of the Apartment Association of Seattle and King County. <laughs> Dennis Keating, who you may have met this morning when he delivered today's keynote address, is the co-author of a recent book on rent control and author of many articles about rent control. Next to Dennis is Jody Haug. Jody is a landlord who lives in Ballard, and she's the chair of the planning committee for the Ballard District Council. <laughs> and next to Jody is Julie Monahan. Julie is a freelance writer living in Seattle. She's a resident of Belltown, where she rents an apartment there. Each panelist is going to speak for under five minutes. 
Uh, and then after they're done, hopefully we'll have some time for some comments and questions and answers. And I want to just make one reminder, similar to what Judy said earlier, in that when we're talking about housing policy, we're really also talking about people's homes. And it's important that we all remember that home is where people get up in the morning, it's where they raise their families, it's where they meet their neighbors, and it's where they return to at the end of long days. It's easy to be abstract and make generalizations and assumptions about housing policy, but let's remember how specific and how personal this topic is to everyone in the room. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, as most of you probably know, uh, rent control has been prohibited on the local level by state law uh, since 1981. And John asked me to spend a little bit of time talking about how that came to be and also uh, talk about some of the implications of that for uh, renters in Seattle as well as renters throughout the state of Washington. Uh, before I do that, first uh, let me briefly say how good it is to see so many people here this morning uh, and the early afternoon and it's good to see many colleagues and co-workers and associates. Uh, uh, just by way of uh, information, how many people recall the name of an organization called ROOF? Renters and Owners Occupied for Fairness and I'll mention them again in a few minutes because they were really uh, the impetus for a rent control campaign here in the city of Seattle. Organized, organized, organized okay. <laughs> Renters and owners or organized for payment. What did I say? <laughs> well, we we need a few more occupations too to deal with this problem. The uh, let me tell you a little bit about the uh, uh, climate for rental housing in the 1970s, which were really uh, the impetuses for the rent control campaign. Uh, these problems will sound familiar. 35,000 households. Uh, were in need of uh, housing financial assistance. Uh, 4,000 rental units were lost since uh, 1970 due to demolitions and condominium conversions. Uh, 16,000 units had been lost in downtown Seattle due to commercial redevelopment. Uh, and rents had doubled uh, in the preceding 10 years. Uh, it was against this backdrop that Roof gathered enough signatures to put Initiative 24 on the ballot in the city of Seattle uh, in the fall of 1980. Uh, and the initiative did four major things. First, it would have frozen rents until March of the following year. Uh, second, it would have rolled back rents to the uh, July 1979 rent level with a one-half consumer price index increase. It would have limited future increases to one-half of the consumer price index change uh, with certain uh, landlord hardship exemptions. Uh, and it would have regulated condominium conversions and demolitions. Uh, as you might gather, uh, this got the real estate community's attention. Uh, and the rent control initiative campaign became, uh, at that time, the most expensive initiative campaign in the city's history. Uh, real estate interests raised over $600,000 to campaign against the initiative. Uh, proponents of the initiative raised a little over $60,000. They were outspent uh, 10 to 1. Uh, as a result of the infusion of money to defeat the initiative campaign, uh, it was defeated uh, two to one at the polls in November of 1980. Approximately 142,000 citizens voted against it, upwards of 75,000 citizens voted in favor of it. The landlords decided that they did not want to do this again. Uh, and uh, in 1981, they convinced the state legislature to pass a state law that prohibits all cities and counties from adopting any form of direct or indirect uh, rent control. Now, uh, we can debate uh, whether rent control, as many people understand it, uh, East Coast style rent control or California style rent control, is good social policy, is good economic policy, uh, is legal in its various forms. Uh, unfortunately, that's a debate that we at the city and county level are prohibited from having in a meaningful way as a result of state law. But I want to concentrate on a few less obvious implications of the prohibition against rent control. Uh, as a result of this prohibition, uh, the law department uh, of the city of Seattle advised the city council in the early 1990s that there were a number of things that they either couldn't do or probably couldn't do. One was require a 60-day notice of rent increase. That was deemed to be, in their opinion, 
rent control because the landlord could not increase the rent during that 60-day period, uh, require offering a, a tenant a six-month or one-year lease, in their opinion, that was also rent control because the landlord would be prohibited from increasing the rent within that six-month or one-year period. Uh, prohibiting rent increases where there were code violations outstanding on the building, in the law department's opinion, that would violate the rent control prohibition as well. Uh, two uh, uh, problems uh, in the rent increase rent control area that are particularly galling. Uh, in 1990, uh, cities and counties were authorized to require owners to pay tenant relocation assistance when low-income tenants were displaced by various kinds of redevelopment. And one of the things that Seattle's early ordinance prohibited was a rent increase in anticipation of a tenant displacement as a result of redevelopment. In 1994, uh, uh, on the recommendation of the law department, the city of Seattle amended the tenant relocation assistance ordinance to prohibit rent increases as uh, an illegal activity uh, that could take place in anticipation of displacement. Uh, and finally, and even more, more galling, uh, last year a landlord was uh, prosecuted under city, the city's housing and building maintenance code for a misdemeanor for raising rents of tenants in retaliation for their reporting housing code violations. And the attorney for the landlord argued that the city ordinance that prohibited retaliatory rent increases also violated the uh, prohibition against rent control imposed at the state level. Now, you might say, well, this was just sort of some bizarre argument. It so happens that the attorney that represented the landlord in that case uh, was the former director of the land use section of the Seattle Law Department. So this was not just an off-the-wall argument that some unskilled attorney manufactured. Uh, if, if you are not uh, outraged by these examples of the uh, invidious effects of a prohibition against rent control at the state level, then uh, I hope you will manage to manufacture that outrage uh, uh, during the course of this section and in the future. Thank you. Something like that. Hi, my name's Chris Bennis, and I come here wearing a couple of hats today at the invitation of uh, Council Member Nicastro. First of all, as was mentioned during the introduction, I am a board member and the former president of the Apartment Association of Seattle and King County, an association of 2,500 rental property owners throughout King County. Quite frankly, the majority of them are here in the city of Seattle. Second of all, I'm a landlord myself. I own a few rental houses. I'll uh, tell you the, the truth, I've elected not to invest in the city of Seattle. And I've sold the few properties I have here because of what I consider personally to be uh, um, an unfavorable regulatory climate, I've, I've, uh, but I am a landlord. Um, finally, I am, a, as was mentioned, a real estate attorney. Steve and I are uh, friendly adversaries from time to time, and I always appreciate the opportunity to be on the same uh, panel with him. Um, I have one introductory comment, which is that I recognize that the uh, topic today is rent control, um, local control of rents. And I think it's important to recognize that there has been no specific proposal that uh, has been brought forward. And for somebody to get up here and, exp and sort of uh, punch at a vacuum is really, really tough. So what I'm going to be doing today is limiting my comments to a couple of things that are in uh, the problems associated with rent control generally because I don't have a specific pro policy proposal to respond to. I also think that when we're going to look at the housing situation in the city of Seattle, we need to always keep in mind the real statistical basis. Where are the rents going? What are the um, vacancy factors? That sort of thing. We always have anecdotal stories in any walk of life. But if we're going to make policy in this city for everybody, we have to look at the entire picture. A, a, an isolated, compelling story is not necessarily a justification for throwing away an entire uh, way of doing business and providing housing in the city. Um, as I was trying to prepare my comments today, I thought to myself, what are the issues that people are concerned about? Now, I've been here all day listening to all of the renters here, and I hope I've, I've uh, crystallized on a couple of things that are important to them as it relates to the local rent control issue. The first of them is incremental rent increases. The idea that rents go up 4%, 5%, 6%, but that that rate of increase is at a factor that exceeds the consumer price index. 
So one of the things that we're looking at is trying to get an, a good five-year baseline, 10-year trend line to figure out where rents are really going in the city. From our perspective, there are some definite increases in housing costs. They're right in line with, in general, in the aggregate, um, individuals' incomes. And um, so in general, while rents are increasing, they're primarily a function of increased expenses and that sort of thing. The second thing that I think that there, some of the renters here are concerned about is the idea of the substantial... <laughs> well... I think that some of the other things that some of the renters here are concerned about is sub substantial rent increases where sometimes they get increase that it vastly isn't, let's, let's put it this way, at least in double digits. I guess, yes, I guess what I would uh, suggest there is that in most cases what's triggering that increase is somebody who's investing in the housing of the city, improving the housing stock, and I'm really concerned about the possibility that we want to discourage people from investing and improving this, the uh, rental housing that's available in the city of Seattle. Finally, the third thing that uh, renters seem to be concerned about are low vacancy rates. The fact that you can go around town and look for an apartment and there's a big line out the door of other applicants that you're going to be competing with. Now, one would say that the people who are providing rental housing want there to be this scarcity. But the truth of the matter is that we are extremely interested in creating housing that's affordable to people. Um, we, unfortunately, there are many factors, and I can't go into them in the one minute I have available, that drive up housing costs. But I'll just mention a couple. In the period 1995 to 1998, City of Seattle's taken 35% of the job growth in King County while only providing 24% of the housing units. So we've got an imbalance there. Second of all, many re uh, neighborhoods in the city have become much more desirable places to live. When I was going to the University of Washington, I lived in Belltown, and it was a cheap, fun place to live, but it was nowhere, it was a little scary, and it was nowhere near as desirable as it is today. So when we're looking at the housing situation, we have to look at um, uh, the positive things that are happening, happening in the city. I only have a very limited amount of time available, but I want to just make a couple of brief comments about rent control generally. Number one, does it work? Uh, with all respect to Professor Keating, who we'll be hearing from next, apparently 93% of the economists in the United States disagree with that. Does it help people in need? According to Professor Keating's book, at least I read the thing from cover to cover the last couple nights, um, it doesn't really help the people that are most in need. The primary benefits go to middle and upper income tenants. So um, on behalf of the Apartment Association, I appreciate the opportunity that's been afforded me to engage in this dialogue. I um, will be interested to hear what the rest of the speakers say, and I want to make uh, it clear to everybody that we are all trying to work together to provide the housing that people are interested in here in the city. Thank you. See, on another panel, somebody was quoting a uh, famous Roman, so with apologies to Shakespeare, I will <clears throat> paraphrase Mark Anthony, I come to, not to bury rent control, but to praise it. Um, always glad that people read my books. Uh, much has been written about rent control, including, uh, I notice in today's Seattle Times, the editorial page, uh, pretty much negative, and as for economists, it's certainly true that the vast majority of economists uh, do not like rent control, but the vast majority of economists have rarely studied it. They start with uh, <laughs> preconceived notions. Um, my background being in law and planning and having been involved in more than a few rent control campaigns in about four and a half minutes, let me try to dispel a few of the myths and point out uh, what rent control can or cannot do, assuming you were allowed to even discuss the possibility of that here in the state of Washington. Uh, there is no rent control. There are many forms of rent control, uh, depending upon what we're talking about, who um, proposed it, how it's structured, how it's enforced, if it's enforced. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said in <clears throat> situations like here in Seattle, that it's a policy that a city at least should consider and at times can be effective. We've had rent control in the United States over the last 30 years in many localities. Alas, uh, I think it's unfortunate, but in a few states, California, Massachusetts, the state legislature has seemed to 
fit to intervene to preempt certain forms of rent control, or in the case of Massachusetts, to eliminate altogether. So rather than waiting for rent control to happen, I take it here in Washington, um, the legislature in its wisdom uh, prevented even the possibility of it occurring, whatever form it might take. If I had the time, and you can read my book, of course, uh, you can read about the various ways rent control has been structured, but I think it's fair to say in most places in the last 30 years, uh, it's allowed for regular rent increases, but not sharp rent increases. It, by law, has to guarantee landlords a fair return. It exempts a fair amount of housing, usually for good reason. Uh, it's temporary. It's usually tied to vacancy rates. It's not a permanent policy. And it does protect with rough justice tenants. It doesn't protect all tenants, and I certainly would not argue that it's a panacea to all the problems that renters face. On the other hand, it serves its purposes, uh, unlike um, critics, it does not cause uh, effects attributable to atomic blast or cancer or acid rain. So uh, many overblown claims. I think when you look at the studies that are often cited, uh, read the fine print. Who sponsored the study? Who paid for the study? Who paid the consultants who wrote it? Let's see. I think my time is running out. So. Uh, I would urge you uh, to consider such a policy, whatever it's called, but obviously the first issue here is to get your state government to allow you to even think about it <clears throat> or discuss it. Once you get beyond that, uh, then you can, as in 1981, uh, whatever money is spent back and forth on elections, you can then debate the pros and cons, and there's certainly a lot to debate about it. And I would be the first not to get up here and claim it's going to solve renters' problems in Seattle. It won't, but it could sure help a lot of tenants in situations like you face. So with that, I will end and save, what, uh, 30 seconds for the next speaker. Thank you very much. I'm Julie Monahan, a member of the Tenants' Union, and I live in affordable housing in Belltown. And I want to thank Judina Castro for this opportunity to speak because, frankly, as a renter, I'm feeling a little worried, actually a lot more, a lot more worried after being here today. Um, <laughs> uh, like so many Seattle tenants, even the well-paid ones, I never know what my rent is going to be from month to month. Um, my situation is fairly stable now. I live in um, uh, low-income housing in, in Belltown. Um, but as my income grows, I probably won't be eligible forever for this housing. And then I ask myself, well, what happens to me then? Um, can I afford to continue to live here and contribute to my community? Will I move from building to building, swooning from one r huge rent increase after another? Um, I have to admit, these are all new questions to me. Uh, as a newcomer to this city a year and a half ago, uh, before that, I lived for five years in a rent-stabilized apartment in New York City. Um, and I'd like to share that experience because of the many misconceptions about rent stabilization. Um, the system in New York certainly has its problems, um, no doubt about it, but the system w definitely worked for me. And it provided me with the stability of knowing where I'd be living from year to year. I had leases that I signed every year. I had uh, an option to sign a two-year lease at a slightly higher rent increase. Um, uh, it let me establish strong roots in my community. I was very active as a volunteer. Um, here in Seattle, I work in my local pea patch, and I'm nervous that climbing Belltown rents will eventually price me out. I don't have a car, so it would be pretty hard to maintain that commitment. Uh, I think rent stabilization in New York is still a system that works for property owners. Um, regulations allow my landlord to increase rents following capital improvements, such as renovation, uh, kitchen renovations, new storm windows. And Again, it certainly works for tenants. In my building, there were struggling, <clears throat> struggling young professionals, and those living near, those nearing a living in retirement. And long-term roots made most of us vigilant to the building's problems and well-being. Um, also, in my experience, rent stabilized does not mean stagnant. My rent went up every year, following an annual review of inflation and building costs. But these costs were uh, increases were reasonable, manageable, and fair. My experience also undermines the false belief that rent control creates decrepit apartments landlords refuse to repair. In general, my superintendent responded very quickly to repair requests. A cracked window, a leaky ceiling, a broken toilet seat. Uh, if he had not, he could file a complaint with a city agency, and that agency would then send a letter, which was usually, usually enough to resolve the problem. Um, 
if a landlord refused to make the repair or did not make the repair, the agency would compile these letters of complaints and if the landlord then went to the agency and said, well, I did these capital improvements, I want a rent increase, they'll say, well, we've got this folder. Um, and uh, especially neglectful landlords might actually see rents go down. Uh, I might also add that even with rent stabilization, New York City is currently enjoying a housing construction boom that includes affordable housing. Um, the system finally works for this finally works for the stability of neighborhoods. It preserved a sense it preserves a sense of community. High rents in other buildings near where I lived often caused high turnover, which, as many landlords know, increases the stress and wear and tear on a building. Long-term residents mean long-term care for buildings and safer neighborhoods. Uh, here's my emotional part that Judy has asked me to keep out, so I will. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to say that even households uh, in Seattle that are pulling in 75000 100000 a year struggle with the ballooning rents here. Um, clearly, such an extreme situation requires regulatory relief, and Seattle needs a system that honors the special role that housing plays in any city that seeks to maintain its diversity, its vibrancy, and its community. I believe that rent is more than a line item in someone's portfolio. It's someone else's dignity, someone's life, someone's home. Thank you. My name is Jody Haug, and I'm a landlord, but sort of a mini landlord. My, my house in Ballard was built in 1890, and rather than sell it and have it torn down to have a parking lot, which I told the guy would only happen over my dead body, I, uh, <laughs> I rent out the top two floors, and my husband and I live in the basement. Uh, the rents, one of the things about being 64 is it appalls you what rents are, and every time I raise the rent, I think, my God, that's a lot of money. But Whenever I do get new tenants, the first three people who see it all want it, so I don't think I'm doing too badly. Uh, I, I also, um, this is my income, and uh, another thing I wanted to mention is that I am a member of a voluntary simplicity study circle, so that a lot of my financial choices have been pared down to what's really important to me. And I think that's that has bearing on my views uh, of the situation. I think one of the things that renters and landlords and landladies are up against is the current uh, kind of bottom line mentality of our culture and a good portion of the world. It's really too bad that right now the thing that matters the most is how much money you can get. I think it's appalling that uh, we really feel that we own this piece of property and we can do anything we want to with it as long as it's legal. And I think that a lot of our legal structures haven't really caught up with this shift because in times past, it was assumed, and rightly so, that the first thing you thought about was the well-being of your community. I mean, what good does it have me does it do me to have my piece of property a certain way if everything around it isn't what I want? Then it becomes not a place that I want to be either. So, <laughs> so I think that one of the things we need to look at is that every one of us, whether we're a renter or a, a landowner, um, or a, a landlord needs to look at this view of the world and decide that it doesn't work and that we are not going to buy into it because if enough of us feel it doesn't work, it loses its power. <laughs> the next thing I want to talk about is enfranchisement. For too long in our culture, it has been so that if you didn't own the place, you didn't count. Now, I know that this has been not so good for renters, but it has also let you off the hook. 
as the chair of the planning committee for the Ballard District Council, the stewardship uh, group for our neighborhood plan. I want to feel that the 52% of the people in this city who vote have a responsibility to participate in their community. We need you. We've got to have you. There's a lot of work to be done out there. The government can't do it all. The people who theoretically at least own the land can't do it all. You are a vital part of our community. And I don't think we should let you off the hook. And I don't think you should fink out on us either. And I know that there are renters who are involved, but there are an awful lot of you who go in your apartment door and close the door and don't feel connected. I think that one of the hallmarks of the success of neighborhood planning is going to be when someone moves, they won't dream of, of moving out of their neighborhood because that's where they live. <laughs> so, Register to vote, vote, find out wh who's doing your neighborhood planning, tutor kids at school, give to the food banks, do things, lots of things, whatever grabs you to become involved in your community. Because all of this helps not only you to be involved, but it also lets the people in your community know that it isn't them versus us. And if enough of us refuse to buy into this bottom line stuff, it, it really loses its power. As I say, I'm still appalled at the rents my places get, but, but I know I could get more, but I'm not going to. So I think tenants, uh, landlords and tenants, need to think about their rights, but they also need to think about their responsibilities and their relationships to each other. I'd like to also see tenants unions and renters groups in all the communities banding together to you know, with their particular t-shirts to do good works around the community. So the community knows you're there, they know who you are, they know who you're participating, so they feel they're invested in you and that you're invested in them. How about a round of applause for each of the panelists? We don't have much time, but uh, I am going to create some space for one or two questions from the audience. And let me say this, that please, uh, if you'd like to make a comment, that's fine, and leave it at that. If you'd like to raise a question, direct it only to one or two of the panelists, and that way we'll have time for as many questions as possible. Uh, the man in the front with the hat, and there's a roaming microphone here. Yes, uh, my name is Chester Smith. Uh, I'm a member of the Union. Like uh, the landlord-tenant uh, law here, it's one thing left out in this law is uh, need to be addressed is it's tenants that are living in uh, low-income housing that they have to, uh, their guests have to show ID to, uh, to, to be in, to enter the, uh, the premises. But there ain't no regulation saying what, uh, what the uh, landlord is doing with this information, you know, uh, this this information could be sold, mm -hmm. uh, it could be did, you know, uh, be did, you know, any kind of way with this type of information. And I think uh, we need to come up with some kind of law to regulate and, and be supervised of uh, where this information go, because you taking people's name, social security number, you know, I, I'm talking about valuable information here. And it's not. In, no, it's not covered in this uh, landlord tenant uh, law here. I think um, it's, if it's a question, it's perhaps something that Steve Fredrickson uh, yes. could speak to in a general way about uh, what rights apartment owners have to uh, take information from tenants. Steve? Well, just <laughs> briefly, there's been a lot of litigation around the country over tenants' First Amendment rights of freedom of association to have visitors and guests, and certainly in the public housing and low-income housing context, there are some constitutional limitations on even requiring ID in the first place, certainly on what you can do with that uh, uh, private information. So I'd be glad to talk to you about that in more detail uh, after the session. Okay. Um, how about the woman in the pink uh, who had your hand up? Yeah, when I first moved into my apartment at Green Lake, 
this was 12 years ago, the rent was $315 a month and my social security came to about uh, 450. Now my social security is 550 and the rent is 635. And Seattle housing has not always been able to subsidize my rent so I only get to pay 30% of my income. The groceries are going up and I'm trying to help my grandson go through his last year of high school. He stays with me four nights a week so that he can commute to school rather than having to come all the way in from Linwood. And I'm finding a really tough job. I'd like to, to know just where the heck is this country's values gone? Don't we value each other? Or is it only money? The uh, uh, gentleman next to you. Hi, I'm Mark Taylor Canfield with the Capitol Hill Community Council, and I'm also on the Committee for Local Government Accountability. And I wanted to say that in my neighborhood on Capitol Hill, even people who are on Section 8, oftentimes uh, through Social Security Disability are making perhaps $500 a month, and their rent, even subsidized under Section 8, is still over $300 a month. So it's not really helping people. They can't live there even on Section 8, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed. But in terms of rent control, I think it would be nice if we would actually get the landlords to actually follow the law first before we introduce some new laws. One of the things that really upset me was in Pioneer Square, the Samus Land Company evicted 70 artists from a co-op down there on May 1st. They went in and ripped people's doors off with crowbars, uh, a representative from Samus Land as well as two off-duty Washington State patrolmen. They had police surrounding the building and in the building for three days before the eviction was even ready which was uh, midnight on May 1st. And I think that when you have people who are being evicted without due process, they had no writ of unlawful detainer, they had no real legal right to forcibly remove these people and, and pr block them from their property. I think, you know, my experience was calling all over the city and calling all of the, the uh, elected officials I could think of who might have something to do with this issue, all of the housing activists and all the housing activist attorneys, we could not get one person to file a restraining order against these people. Now, that's bad enough, but the real problem is, is that the reason these people are being evicted partly is because William Justin is putting his penthouse on the sixth floor, his $4 million penthouse. Do we know who William Justin is? He's the ex-head of the Department of Construction and Land Use. Sir, I think somebody needs to look into that. We've got we to gotta wrap it up. Uh, we need to be out of the room shortly, so unfortunately we don't have any more time for questions and comments, but I'm sure all the panelists um, are happy to stay here for a little while, and we expect plenty of people to stay around for some dialogue. But before we end, however, it's, it's, it's not over. We just have to be out of the room in about 15 minutes. Um, there are pink comment forms that you can fill on your way out, and that will allow you to uh, give comments to Judy Nicastro's office that you weren't able to give to uh, members of the panel at any time throughout the day. Uh, let me say this in closing, though, that you know, one of the greatest deeds that anyone can do is to bring people who are affected by a common problem together to find some common solutions. And this type of work goes on every day in our community. Uh, many of the organizations that do this work around housing are represented on the wall over here to my left from Real Change to the Tenants Union to the Seattle Office of Housing and the Association of Nonprofit Housing Developers. But there are also people who work in the community and then take that work into government with them. Um, and many of us know Larry Gossett, who for years uh, worked in the community on civil rights and employment issues, but he didn't stop working when he got into government. And there's another person in that room who also didn't stop working, and she's Judy Nicastro, and she's going to come and close it. Thanks to so many of you, to all of you for coming. How many here, by the way, are renters? Whoa! Good numbers. Wow, that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Well, hang in there. Nine out of your city council members are here today. The mayor is here today. Uh, we will be working on all of these, on many, many of the six policies and a lot of others that are coming their way. Uh, here's the, the rest of the agenda. We've got about 20 more minutes. Uh, we have a, a wonderful treat. The mayor from Burlington, Vermont is here, and Burlington, Vermont is a fabulously progressive city 
and he's going to speak for just a few minutes, and then uh, Mayor Paul Schell and I will be giving out awards to the most amazing landlord. I thought mine was fabulous, and mine is fabulous, but this man is running a close second to her. So please stick around for that, um, and also to a wonderful tenants group that has been um, really at the forefront of helping us come up with better policies. So um, with that, I will do an introduction for Mayor, uh, for Mayor Clavel, who is from Burlington, Vermont. We have quite a treat with the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors is going on right now in Seattle. Uh, Mayor Clavel has been involved in city management and public service for more than 25 years. He was appointed personnel director in 1982 by then Burlington Mayor's Bernie Sanders, now Vermont's independent at-large congressman. Shortly after he was appointed at Burlington as Burlington's first director of community and economic development, during his tenure there, he developed nationally recognized programs in housing, job creation, and training, uh, and training neighborhood preservation and waterfront revitalization. He was elected as mayor of Burlington in 1989 and is now serving his fifth term. Please welcome me in uh, welcoming Mayor Clavel. It's a pleasure for me to uh, spend a few moments with you today, and I'm really invigorated by, by the turnout, and I commend City Council and McCastro for bringing so many people together to discuss this issue. So I bring from you to you greetings from the People's Republic of Burlington. It's nice, it's nice to be with you. And Burlington is a much different city, a much smaller city than Seattle, but I'm just struck by the similarities that do exist. We are, in fact, a city of renters. Approximately 60% of our population are renters. We have an incredibly low vacancy rate in the city, less than one quarter of 1%. And we have a housing crisis like you do, a crisis both in terms of affordability and availability. I also view this problem from the perspective of the mayor's task force, national task force on hunger and homelessness. And I'm struck by the irony that we are experiencing a so-called unprecedented era of prosperity. Yet the numbers of folks in this country that are seeking emergency shelter and emergency food are greater than ever before. And if you scratch below the surface of homelessness and hunger, at the top of the pile is affordable housing that contributes to this national disgrace that at a time of unprecedented prosperity, more kids are going to bed hungry and more working families do not have a place to live. I just want to say this, that I think the fundamental problem when we deal with the housing crisis in Burlington and Seattle in this country is one of attitude. And the problem is that the prevailing attitude is that housing is a commodity to be, to be bought and sold like oil, like gold, like pork bellies to the highest bidder. And I think what we need to do, and we've, what we've tried to do in Burlington, is to embrace the attitude that housing, safe, decent, and affordable housing, is a basic right for every American. <laughs> so I, I, I look, I will go home with some good ideas that I've already picked up today, but I also will be happy to share with you the Burlington housing strategies. And basically, we have a very activist housing program that's built on four Ps. The production of new units of affordable housing. We work very closely with the nonprofit sector. We also have inclusionary zoning in the city, which says that if you're going to build expensive housing, you must also build for people of low and moderate income. The second P is preservation. It's one that is sometimes lost, but we must be constantly mindful of preserving the existing affordable housing stock, much of it that's on the chopping block as a result of the expiration of federal programs. The fourth P is the protection of most vulnerable. And as you know, frequently tenants are vulnerable, particularly tenants that have issues with disabilities, and senior citizens are very vulnerable. 
And we have adopted a number of ordinances in Burlington, including uh, condominium conversions, security deposit ordinances. We now need to adopt a just cause eviction ordinance in the city. I don't know if you have one. And, and, and the, last, the last P, and I think it's an important P, is the promotion of home ownership. And in Burlington, we've tried to envision this housing tenure ladder that folks should be able to climb if they decide to climb and if they decide that they are interested in home ownership. And basically, to me, it's an issue of security and mobility. If you're a tenant, you ought to have the right to stay put, but you also ought to have, if, so, if you so desire, the chance to move on. So those are just a few insights uh, from Burlington. I'm happy to be here with you today, and I want to thank uh, Mayor Paul Schell and the City of Seattle for doing a great job in rolling out the red carpet for 300 mayors from across the country. Thank you. Well, thank you. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Paul Schell. Thank you, Judy, and thank you for taking on this issue. Our real challenge in our city that's succeeding wildly beyond anybody's dreams is how we can succeed and not lose our soul. And our soul is defined in the city of small towns where people take care of each other. How we keep that while we don't lose the job opportunities that are out there for our children. I think it was Chief C. Alf who said that uh, we don't really uh, inherit this world, which signifies ownership. We're borrowing it from our children. And we need to find a way to leave it intact, both as good environmental stewards, but also have stewards of a spirit that says we care about each other, that's how we succeed. If you will read, and I, I listened to the, the, the four Ps, Mayor, and I think if you look at the Office of Housing Strategy, we're following each one of those. Doesn't mean we can't do better in each category, but uh, over, um, we did over 1,400 units of affordable housing last year. Over 25% of the new housing built fits that category. That we need to do more, you're going to get the chance. We're going to ask the voters in 2002 for a renewal of the housing levy. Seattle was the first city in the country to start taxing ourselves as the federal government started getting out of the housing business. And we are getting in it. But we need to find ways to draw and leverage that dollar on with every other private dollar we can get to achieve this very important goal. And so I pledge to work with all of the council to find ways to Treat everybody with respect in this community. I absolutely agree. Housing is not a luxury item. Housing is a necessity, and everybody is entitled to fair, decent, and safe housing in our community. Ten I don't want to get into debates. <laughs> that's, that's not fair or safe. So we need to find ways to address that directly. Last, I would say every idea is a good idea. We need to examine and hear from you, so I want to thank all of you for taking the time. The sun is shining outside, Mayor, as uh, we promised rain and gave them all umbrellas when they got here as a sign of good luck. But uh, this is an important issue. This is the issue, along with congestion, that we need to find answers for because we cannot call ourselves a successful community when we have longer food lines, more people in need of shelter, housing that people can't afford. The average house is $270,000. In the city, you need to earn $95,000 a year to be able to qualify to buy a home. You'll see lots of programs from home sites to uh, location-efficient mortgages to uh, property tax abatements. The real key here is to get housing back on the federal agenda. And we spent time today and yesterday with uh, the president, uh, or the vice president's campaign saying you've got to put it back on. As we look about giving tax cuts with our prosperity at the federal level, we need to be thinking about investing in the most, most basic need that our citizens have in this community. And it's not limited to Seattle. It's happening all over the country. So if we don't pay attention to that, we can't call ourselves a successful country. It isn't about the bottom line. It is about it. Read the Office of Housing proposal, which was a concrete proposal, and read the program that's in there. And I think you'll find the city's doing a lot. We need a lot more to do. And I think we need your help in making that happen. Thank you. Well, this is um, the very first time we have ever given out an outstanding landlord award, and we will be giving, an out, giving out an outstanding renter's award. Um, Alvin Hendricks is 
the recipient of this award. And he doesn't like the word landlord. So I won't use that word. He likes the word friends and family. And you will understand why. He is the kind of individual that we would all love to have as the manager of our building. Since he bought the El Capitan Apartments on Capitol Hill in 1971, he has personally interviewed every person that applied to live there. That's how we found out about him. Someone, a renter, went and applied and interviewed and was shocked, pleasantly surprised. Mr. Hendricks asks people about their lives. He gets to know them one-on-one. -on -one. Quote, I'm more interested in people than money, he says. I don't really need their money, he tells them. I need good people in my building. He tells tenants that if they live by the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated yourself, then you will work out just fine at the El Capitan. He says he shakes hands of new tenants instead of running a credit check or verifying the check for deposit and last month's rent. <laughs> this system has served him very well for over 30 years. He puts his profits back into the property, keeping it a respectful place to live. He keeps his rents below market rate. The average rent for studios and one bedrooms is between $450 and $600. And he raises rents once about every two years, maybe $25, maybe $50 at the most. He is a model for responsible, respectable friends and family who are making investments in our community. Please help me. It is truly an honor to honor this man Alvin Hendricks as the Renter Summit Outstanding Friend and Family. I never dreamed I would ever receive anything like this, and uh, I never even dreamed I would have someone explain how I operate and how nice I am, because I don't know. <laughs> but finally, with all these beautiful words, you know, I don't like the word landlord. I'm not lord over anyone. I am your friend, and you are a member of my family. And that's what I believe, and that's the way I was trained by my father. And I was born in this town, and I'm going to die in this town, and I'm going to take care of the El Capitan apartments until I'm gone, and then it'll go on to my family. So I really appreciate all you've done and all you've said. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, I actually apologize to him for this, that now his waiting list, he has a waiting list, of course, is only, to, only going to get even longer. And you know, his apartment, the, the El Capitan is on Capitol Hill. Imagine what he, he could actually sell that building for a fortune and make a fortune, and you don't. Thank you. Just an upstanding community member. Well, now for the tenants. We could not pick one tenant this year. Instead, we are picking one of the most courageous groups of individuals that I have ever met, the Biltmore Tenants Collective. When many of you have read about them, they've gotten extensive press. When the tenants at the Biltmore, Collect Biltmore Apartments on Capitol Hill first received their notice that their building was sold to a new owner, they did not reala realize what was in store for them. Soon after they received a hefty rent hike, 
a couple of tenants were aware of a city law that mandated 60-day notice for rent hikes over 10 percent. They knew that the management had violated this, so they talked to neighbors, signed a complaint letter to management, and sought help from elected officials. They were successful in getting the illegal rent hike rescinded, but unfortunately, a steeper rent hike soon followed for many who had complained, and the battle has ensued to this day. The city attorney's office decided not to prosecute the Biltmore management because they could not be assured of proving retaliatory intent beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a criminal standard. We're looking at reducing that to a civil standard. The Biltmore tenants are changing policy. In recognition of their struggle, their persistence, and their inspiration, and the courage to speak out, it is very, very scary to make a phone call, to say something to anyone that you're going to lose your home, and they did this. If you all could please come on up and accept an award, and please welcome me, uh, help me in honoring the Renter Summit Outstanding Tenant Award. So we've Thank you. <laughs> Great. Here you guys go. Steve Medina, Russell Scheidelman, Garwood Nickel, Julie Hughes, Kara Seibner, Heather Wright, Lee Lumson, Devin Decourt, Brandon Woodruff, and John Shalada. Thank you. There you go, there's her website. Okay, well, thank you. Um, in wrapping up, where do we go from here? I'll, you know, I've gotten a, a bunch of wonderful uh, emails from renters saying, um, telling me their story and then saying, please help me, please do something. And, and it, it's disappointing that the pessimism is so great. Uh, but I hope that with the beginning of the summit, it was a campaign promise. I followed through on a campaign promise. And just as I promised I would put on the Renter Summit, I promise you that I will spend the next three and a half years working very hard on rental housing policy and for renters. So please look at the back of the booklets. We discuss next steps. Everything that we discussed today does not go through my committee. <laughs> it will go through other committees. My office will work with you on some of those policies and others. We had nine all of your city council members, all nine of us, were here today, and the mayor. This is a city that cares and that needs your help, and we will move forward together as a community. Thank you all so much for coming. Enjoy the sun. Thank you.